This is NDTV. And you're watching NDTV Prime. Hello and welcome. Today on the show we find out what are some of the biggest environmental challenges of the day and how we are dealing with them and also explore environmental careers. Delhi grey and smogged out. Almost each day the headlines have revolved around what India's heavily polluted capital is doing to its people. Radical steps like allowing odd and even numbered cars on alternate days are being hotly debated as these images become common occurrence, but it'll be a while before the sky is clear. Recent readings of the Delhi Pollution Control Committee indicate high levels of particulate pollutants PM2.5 and PM10 in Delhi's air. Their levels 60 and 100 micrograms per cubic meter, way above safe limits of 10 and 20 micrograms per cubic meter according to the World Health Organization. One of the most notorious killers causing more than 3 million deaths around the world every year, particulate matter are small particles caused by the burning of oils, gasoline and other fuel. So if you look at what's happening in Delhi, it's a situation of public health emergency. Uh, Beijing, when for three days, uh, when, when their air quality index was 200, schools were shut down. We were on as in a couple of days ago, we were 999, which is, you know, particulate matter, for example, is supposed to be 25 and we are at 183 and still there's no hue and cry. And there's still no, no advisory that we have from the government as yet. Beating Beijing on particulate matter pollution, Delhi recently became the world's most polluted city. Its 8.1 million registered vehicles and a thousand new ones added on its roads every day are the biggest contributors to Delhi's declining air quality. To discuss more on how we are dealing with the biggest environmental issues of the day, I have with us today Dr. Panwar, who is the Director of Climate Change and Energy at World Wildlife Fund India, and Mike Pandey, who is a wildlife filmmaker and conservationist. Dr. Panwar, my first question to you. With conference of parties and initiatives as such happening every year, do you think it has sort of become an you know, a college assignment that the world leaders just procrastinate their way towards and do some last-minute firefighting. Let's understand that these COP negotiations which are there are extremely complex because this involves not only environmental issues but has wider implications in terms of the economy and the development of the country. Secondly, we should also recognize that there are 196 countries and there are large differences amongst the stage of development, amongst the aspirations of the people of those countries. And you have to, each of the governments will have to cater to all of that. Yes. Having said that, it is recognized that climate change is an important environmental issue which has to be dealt with. And there are these negotiations happening which try to move ahead and increase the agenda. What is required is that the pace of agreement has to be enhanced now because science is very clear, climate change is happening. The Indian Prime Minister along with the French President launched the International Solar Alliance which is supposed to bring 120 world countries together. Now India when we look at the country we have 72% of our power generation coming from coal fired plants. Do you think it's practically possible for India to do away with its coal power plants? To tackle issues of climate change and of air pollution. It is important that we move towards renewable energy sources and that is why the Indian government's announcement in its INDC to go to 40% of renewable energy based power generation capacity in the country by 2030 is very significant and even before that we have a target of 175 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2022. Mike, getting you into the conversation, now we see a lot of climate change experts from around the world giving a counter argument that climate change may not have necessarily created a harmful effect for humanity. Do you think it is a valid argument? 
Uh, living in a tropical country, I don't see any good that has come with. We've had uh, species migration. We've had uh, farmers in great trouble. We have, uh, we, India has been the worst sufferers of the effects of climate change in the last 20 years. The developing countries, especially in the Southeast Asian region, have suffered the most. Maybe the person who made that statement was thinking of uh, the Western world, which is colder, and they need warmer climates. Front-runner President in, in, in Mr. Trump, who feels that climate change doesn't exist. But what about the devastation that we see here? He has to see what's happening to Chennai. He has to see rain and snow and hail in, in Iraq to understand the ground realities. So I think there are lots of people, they can make statements, they are welcome to it. Now, Beijing recently declared a smog alert and Delhi sort of following its footsteps and you know, grappling with the same problem remained inactive until now. Why do you think we have been unable to deal with this situation? Is it a lack of political will or we can say that it's practically impossible to fix Delhi's air? I think this is a multi-pronged area. First of all, we in India need to be citizens. We carry a certain amount of responsibility. No government alone can bring about a change. I think there's a little bit of uh, uh, lack of political will, but there's also arrogance. So when you get into a gridlock and a jam and nobody gives way, so the traffic is blocked there for about six to 12 hours, 25,000 cars burning fossil fuel. This is uh, adding to the, to the pollution in the air, in the atmosphere. Talking about the bigger issue, a rapid species extinction. As a filmmaker and conservationist who spent more than three decades in the Indian forest, how do you see the forest of India have changed over a period of time? And also, if we talk about the conservation challenges, what are the biggest issues that we are facing today? We have degraded forests, which are also contributing to a great, uh, especially in livelihoods of local communities, uh, towards the degradation of species also. For example, when there's no food, communities go inside forests and kill all the animals and all. We need an intact, balanced ecosystem, especially the forest ecosystem which is a life support system to the whole planet. There is a need for citizen science, really, for people to understand the link between our own lives and forests. Yeah. In many regions, for example, in Karnataka, in Hassan district, farm, farmers have migrated because they cannot farm anymore. In uh, the hills where um, leopards have been killed, they've been called pests, monkeys and wild boars have proliferated and make it impossible for farmers to uh, farm there. So there's an exodus happening. Over three to 400 villages have um, been evacuated. So the impact is everywhere. In uh, Himachal Pradesh, because of climate change, the apple does not grow at a certain altitude anymore. It's become too warm and fungus is eating up. Climate change also will bring about a proliferation of pathogens, different diseases, bacteria, the whole lot. And farmers are now in Himachal Pradesh moving up to a higher altitude. But where will they go after that? I mean, we're all aiming for a two degrees cap. Maybe in relation to the Western world, two degrees does not mean anything. But here, there'll be turbulence. The need is for an equilibrium. We have destroyed that. And if you look at uh, the forest of um, South India, where the Western Ghats are, many sensitive species are disappearing. The Western Ghats are rep a repository of some of the most uh, rare medicinal plants. We have the highest number of medicinal plants in the world. But because of temperature, they're moving out. Because even the corals, because of temperature, corals are dying. So the impacts are visible. Well, the clear picture that I get out of the entire discussion is that there are plenty of ideas and initiatives, but a clear lack of aggressive implementation. Well, thanks to both of you for being a part of the discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Young India today understanding its role in creating a greener future looks forward to environmental careers with an enthusiasm. Let's have a look at an interesting story of a young research scholar from Kerala and find out how his research can impact our future. Twenty-seven years old and currently pursuing a PhD from the Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology, Arun Prasad Kumar recently won the Green Talents Award in Germany for his research in remote sensing technology. He has an academic background in remote sensing technology, ecosystems and forestry and five Indian scholarship awards under his belt. The only Indian among 27 winners from 90-odd countries, 
Arun's thesis on species level classification of mangroves using hyperspectral imaging gives an understanding of the dynamics of different mangrove species in the ecosystem. And we can also monitor the health status of mangroves uh, using several uh, things. So uh, that will actually help to help the um, conservation activist and the government to, to monitor that particular species or that particular area. Besides mangrove conservation, an estimation of agricultural production, temperate forest mapping and identification of illegal logging are among other areas where Arun's research will be of help to future researchers. With an increased demand for environment experts and the government laying more emphasis on research, a research career in environmental science can be promising and bright. For students wanting to take up environmental research careers in India, some of the popular study topics include habitat and biodiversity management, environmental health, nuclear energy and urban waste management among others. Well, it's time for us to slip into a short break. Don't go anywhere because on the other side we will explore how you can kickstart an environmental career.